Well, if you will turn to Psalm 22 in your Bibles. We're going to look for David here, excuse me, look for Christ here. And this is the easiest place of all to look for him. The whole psalm is about him. Predominantly about his death for us, but references to his birth and references to his rule on earth at the end of time. So it covers everything. Uh, David wrote this approximately 1,050 years before Christ. But it's uh, quoted in the New Testament seven times. You remember that's always a good thing when you find the Old Testament quoted in the New Testament. Then it's safe to make an application there. But the amazing thing is that David gave more than 30 specific descriptors, descriptors of death by crucifixion when crucifixion had not been practiced yet. Be centuries later. The Romans would perfect that, if I can use that adjective with that thing. But he not only described Christ's death, he described the behavior of individuals and things that they would say a thousand years before. Does God know everything we say? That's an awesome thought. Uh, Charles Wesley, one of our favorite hymn writers, said we should read Psalm 22 reverently and remove the sandals from our feet as the Lord instructed Moses at the burning bush. For if there's holy ground anywhere in the scriptures, it's in this psalm. So this is a precious one. Look at verse 1. He jumps right into it, doesn't he? Is that familiar? <laughs> my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When were those words uttered again? Christ from the cross. Uh, now, many of our psalms, there's kind of a parallel event in David's life that was also in Christ's life that he describes. But David had no parallel to this event. He had uh, pain. He had attacks from others, but nothing like what Christ had. Uh, why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? The Hebrew word for God, both times in verse 1, is El, the strong God of the covenant, like El Shaddai, <laughs> Almighty God. Uh, and this is the first time in eternity that the Son of God was uh, uh, not in precious fellowship with God the Father. You think since eternity, which I can't fathom, they had always been together. They had always been one. Uh, and now Jesus feels forsaken. I remember as a child dreaming my mother left me. And I was saying, don't leave me, don't leave me. And she walked off. I still see that 50s outfit she had on. That was the most terrifying moment of my life. We had just moved from home with all our relatives to a new state where we didn't know anybody, and that probably contributed to that uh, dream. But that was a, a major fear, abandonment. I want to ask you a question, and I don't want you to answer out loud, but do you, did God the Father abandon Jesus on the cross? Let's just hold that thought as we look. Uh, the second part of that verse says, Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? That Hebrew word is unusual. It can be translated either moan or roar like the roar of a lion before it pounces or the cry of an animal that's in distress caught in a trap or whatever. Um, 
in Jewish family life, one scholar wrote that it was the mother's task to teach her children to say the Psalms. A child would stand by mother's knee and learn the Psalms. She would teach them phrase by phrase. Can you imagine a young Jesus standing by his mother's knee, memorizing these words? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I don't know if he had any understanding as a child that that would be him. Uh, well, look at verse 2. Here's some more prayer. Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. That Hebrew word means hear and respond. There's a difference between hearing and hearing and responding, and it means both. And in the night season, and I am not silent. Now, he used a different word for God in verse 2. It is the Elohim word, the word that we learned in Genesis 1. The plural word, <laughs> Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, no response to him. Now, I can guarantee you that if any of you who are parents or grandparents or great-grandparents, if your child or your grandchild called out to you in distress, you would respond. And that's how scammers get money from grandparents, pretending to have their grandchild and not release the grandchild unless they send money. And that's a lucrative business because that's just the truth. Even as sinful humans, we respond. Uh, but then Jesus gives us the answer to why in verse 3. Why was God not responding to Jesus' cry? This sounds strange at first glance. Because he's holy, and what was Jesus bearing at that moment? Sin. His sin? Our sin. God, holy God, cannot be in the presence of sin, or he wouldn't be holy. So, uh, God never overlooks sin, he never winks at sin, he demands a price be paid for sin. But it's so weird to my thoughts that Christ was the one this happened to. Wasn't he the only holy one that ever lived? He was perfect. Didn't Jesus say, I do always those things that please my Father? Didn't God say from heaven, heaven, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased? But ladies, I want you to focus that it was your sin, my sin that was separating Christ, and he was forsaken, so we would never have to be forsaken. He was the only one who was ever forsaken by God. You know, it is a comfort to us in trials of life and in old age and on our deathbeds that the Lord is our shepherd he is watching over us, even in the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil because God is with us. What Jesus experienced at this moment never happened to anyone else. Um, one writer said that part of sin's punishment is being abandoned by God in hell. And that's true of hell. There's total abandonment from any help. Nothing can help you then. Uh, that's an awesome thought. And to say there are no cell phones in hell <laughs> doesn't begin. Well, look at verse 4. Christ says, our fathers trusted in thee. Who do you think he was talking about? Abraham, <laughs> Isaac, Jacob. Joseph, Moses, <laughs> David, all right. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. Hebrew word means rescue. Other people cried, and God rescued him. Verse 5, they cried unto thee and were delivered. 
They trusted in thee and were not confounded or disappointed. You helped them. Now, these people, the fathers, were all sinners, <laughs> as you know if you read the Old Testament, but they were never forsaken by God. That was a sentence reserved for the spotless Lamb of God. This psalm broke my heart as I studied. Look at verse 6. But I am a worm and no man. That word, I tried to think of a sports team named the Worms. We don't name our sports teams that way because we don't value worms. We name them Strong things like grizzlies or titans or timber wolves or lions, lions yes, giants. <laughs> but Jesus, how esteemed was he? Like a worm. And that Hebrew word for worm is... Uh, it... I'm, I'm not going to say it because I don't know how to say it. Tolal, I think it is. But it's a worm that they crushed, and when they crushed it, it yielded scarlet dye. And co co cochineal is something we might be familiar with because in the Americas, the Indians and the Mexican, there's a little, actually it's an insect, but it looks kind of like a worm that was crushed, and you had to completely crush it get all its innards out to get the dye. And you had to crush thousands to have very much dye. But that's the word he used. I am the worm crushed to produce scarlet dye. He had to dye to produce the D-Y-E. <laughs> uh, and he was crushed by the hatred of his enemies, but mostly under the wrath of God that we might be clothed in scarlet. <laughs> he also suffered from being hated by men. Look at verse 7. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing how he delighted in him. Isn't that amazing? That's what people said at the cross. That's what people said at the cross. In fact, the Bible says they wagged their heads. When you were a kid, did anybody ever wag their head at you? Nanny, nanny, nanny. Yeah. But this is grown-ups. And this is what they are saying at this precise moment because they knew he trusted in God and it sure didn't look like God was helping did it I was amazed to find out that in the Hebrew Old Testament there are seven distinct words for trust this word is the only place it occurs in the Old Testament it's different from all the rest and it has the meaning of roll it on Jehovah Roll it on Jehovah. Are you having a hard time? Well, roll it on Jehovah. I'm amazed that God did not strike them at that point. And when they said that, they had no idea. Now, in the New Testament, it's another word because it's a Greek word and not a Hebrew word. That word, Jesus used himself to describe people who trusted in riches or trusted in themselves. So it has a negative connotation. In the, has anybody ever scorned you that way? I know everybody has had scorn from another human being, at least at some point. Sometimes you live with the person you get scorned from, and it's not easy. <laughs> but I don't think any of us at any point ever suffered this. And how did David happen to mention this at this time, writing about the cross? Well, in the next two verses, we have an insight from the speaker, who is Christ, and he mentions his mother. This is strange. 
at this time. And one scholar said, I have not checked this out, but I think he's right. There is never any mention in the Old Testament of a human father, only of a human mother from Genesis, uh, the seed of woman. Uh, It only speaks of his ancestor mother or the woman who would give him birth. And here's some insights that I'd never thought about. Look at verse 9. Nine, he says to God the Father, Thou art he that took me out of the womb. I guess we've probably all had babies, and I think you had somebody. You had a doctor, you had a midwife, you had your mother, <laughs> your husband, although you found him help, not very helpful. <laughs> uh, Who did Mary have when Jesus was born? Only a man with whom she had never had sex. Uh, Do you think Satan tried at Jesus' birth to destroy him? Do you think he tried during her pregnancy to destroy him? Did he try after the baby's birth? But God was in control control of his birth just like God was in control of his death even that suffering Uh, look at the last part of verse 9 thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast what was he thinking about did he have God thoughts as an infant did he call on God Verse 10, I was cast upon thee from the womb. Father God, you know I almost died a lot of times. (laughs) Thou art my God from my mother's belly. God had preserved him during that. He preserved him in his boyhood and his manhood. And it's like Christ is appealing based on these past mercies. Father, will you? Help me now. Verse 11, he says, Don't be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Where are his disciples? (laughs) Judas betrayed. Uh, Peter tried, but he ran. John was around and apparently on the fringes. Uh, Could Jesus have called angels to minister to him during this time? Didn't he say in the garden, I could have called? It says legions in some translations, basically that's 7,200. Excuse me, (laughs) 72,000. That's quite a crew. Did angels ever minister to Jesus when he was a human on earth? Oh, where the temptation so angels could and did that's the only one we're told about but they could and they did you know I was reading this morning in 2nd Timothy about Paul talking about being on trial and he wrote in 2nd Timothy 4 17 everyone forsook me but the Lord stood by me (laughs) Again, I see the only one that ever had to feel the forsakenness of God. The only one that can ever say, ever not say, for thou art with me. And then in verses 12 through 18, he describes some of the sufferings. Many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me or encircled me round. Uh, Bashan was a large farming district famous for pasture lands, and so that's where bulls were uh, kept and bred. Uh, Bulls in a group will gather around any unfamiliar object, person or object, that they have never seen before, growling and pawing the earth, and they eventually attack it and destroy it. That's very descriptive of the people who cried, Crucify him, crucify him. 
They were surrounding him. They would not quit until they had destroyed him. Uh, Verse 13, they gaped upon me with their mouths. That's an open mouth. That's the weapon of a lion when he opens his mouth. I mean, he's got strong paws and he's got claws, but that mouth is his weapon. And that's the picture here. They gaped upon me with their mouths mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. Oh, roaring lion? Who else does that remind you of? Satan. Satan was present. I had never thought that Satan was present, nor had I thought the forces of evil were there. Uh, I'm going to give you a reference for that in just a moment. Do you ever consider that? Do you ever talk to Satan? Do you ever encounter a demon? Well, we know Satan is the roaring lion, but the difference is now the Father is not intervening. Uh, and no angelic help is available. Uh, Colossians two fourteen and 15 says that Jesus spoiled principalities and powers. It's two terms Paul used to describe spiritual wickedness, demons, principalities and powers. And Jesus on the cross made a show of them openly. Because he would obey the Father, whatever. I've known about the sufferings of Christ all my life. I don't think I've ever seen them till I'm seeing them through David's words. Verse 14, I'm poured out like water. You ever feel that way? <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I just disintegrate into a puddle. I have noticed as a nurse that when death is approaching, people are very weak. They can't hardly raise their hand, open their eyes, form a word, take a sip for weakness. Um, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. How many of you have ever had a bone out of joint? Anybody ever had a shoulder out? I'm glad. <laughs> or a finger. <laughs> it's, it's excruciating pain to have one. Would Christ have out-of-joint bones on the cross? Oh, yes. The weight of his body probably pulled both of his shoulders out of joint. The nails made bones out of joint. My heart is like wax, melted in the midst of my bowels. If the heart of Christ, the line of the tribe of Judah, <laughs> was like wax and melting, what heart can endure when God deals with sin as he will at the end of time? I had never seen a verse in Ezekiel. I've given you the reference I mean, I've read it many times because I've read the Bible through. I never applied it here. Ezekiel said, can your heart endure or can your hands be strong in the days that I shall deal with thee? I, the Lord, have spoken it and I will do it. Now, I've heard people say, oh, when Jesus comes back, I'm going to ask him why he didn't. No. <laughs> no. When God comes to deal with sin, our hearts will be like wax unless God has saved us by his grace. Uh, verse 15, my strength is dried up like a potsherd. Or that's a piece of pottery that had been dried in a kiln or some kind of fire. Any of you ever do that? How hot is a kiln? <laughs> Hotter than our ovens. <laughs> Very hot. My strength is dried up like a piece of pottery out of the kiln. And my tongue cleaves to my jaws. We would say my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. 
Has that ever happened to you every morning? <laughs> but we have water available. He was offered vinegar, right? Thou hast brought me into the dust of death, laid me in the dust to die. I think this is the time Jesus said, I thirst from the cross, and somebody offered him vinegar on a sponge, and actually John tells us he tasted it and he died. It was right at the end of his long times of suffering. I wondered if David used this uh, laid me in the dust to die, uh, thinking about what God said to Adam after the first sin. Dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Laid me in the dust is an Old Testament expression for dying. Uh, and then in verse 16, he says, For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked has enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. The first phrases talk about the people, the Jewish people. But there were somebody there was somebody else who pierced his hands and his feet who did that job. The soldiers. Uh, even in Bible times, Jewish people called Gentiles dogs. The Romans were in charge of this execution, and they were the ones that pierced his hands and feet. I did not know until study that sometimes in crucifixion, both the hands and the feet were not pierced. Sometimes they were tied to the cross, or sometimes the, high, the hands were pierced, but the feet were tied. Uh, sometimes nothing was pierced because that made you suffer longer. Uh, and David predicts there that his hands and his feet would be pierced. Did that happen? Mm -hmm. Is there any way we can know that? Right. He said, Thomas, look at my hands. Put your finger there. <laughs> See that? I had never thought until... Someone I read said, what does that mean to have your hands and your feet pierced? If your hands are held by nails, you have no way to defend yourself. If your feet are held by nails, you have no way to escape. Oh, what utter abandonment. Some of you who are interested in art probably know Rembrandt, the great... Dutch painter of the 1600s. He was a master. He painted many biblical scenes, but he painted people in the clothes of his day, which was interesting. <laughs> he, he had several paintings of the cross and the crowd around the cross. And in one of his paintings, Rembrandt painted himself standing in the shadow at the edge because Rembrandt knew that it was his sin that put Christ there. How many times have we viewed this and thought, oh, well, that's a shame. But we had no sense of my sin put him there. Uh, that's why Charles Wesley said that quote at the top. Now, you know Charles Wesley. He wrote the hymn that we may love best at our church. Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued like a dog, Amazing love, how can it be <laughs> that thou, my God, would die for me? <laughs> Ooh, thank you, Charles. <laughs> Verse 17, I may tell all my bones. The Hebrew word means count. Um, I don't remember how many bones you have. I think it's more than 200. <laughs> One of you homeschoolers, 206? <laughs> okay. <laughs> been a long time since I thought about that. <laughs> and I will tell you, I have been guilty of at times saying, every bone in my body hurts. Oh. Have you ever said that? <laughs> well, we, we don't know, do we? 
Uh, despite his great suffering on the cross and despite every bone in his body hurting, John is very careful to tell us that none of his bones were broken. And what is the significance of no broken bones? Passover. The Passover lamb. Jesus is our Passover. And the, in fact, Moses kind of harped on this several times in the books he wrote about the Passover. Don't break a bone of that lamb. And then they look and stare upon me. One scholar said the greatest shame in Jewish culture was to be seen naked. I think I understand that. Uh, verse 18, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Now this is an amazing prophecy. Roman soldiers were in the habit of dividing or tearing up the clothes of a person they crucified. And I think those clothes were probably just rags. But they had a lot of armor to keep shiny. And so they would put them to use. So they parted his garments between them. But there was one they did not tear. His seamless robe. Um, so they decided to roll the dice for it. Now, I don't. I think there was some kind of casting of lots in Old Testament time. But I don't know if it was dice. I don't know the origin of dice, but Roman soldiers carried dice with them, and they loved to play games with dice. One uh, writer, John Hunter, who was from England, talked about seeing the places where the Roman Empire moved up into England, actually just about 10 years after Christ. And in one of the Roman fortifications, there was in the floor a rectangle filled with little squares like a checkerboard, and it was where the Roman soldiers played their dice games. Uh, so they weren't doing anything unusual, though I don't think David had ever seen dice or anyone playing with them. Uh, Thirty-plus specific references to the crucifixion a thousand years earlier and hundreds of years before anybody was crucified. Uh, is, it, is this inspired? <laughs> well, look at the resulting prayer. Christ is still suffering and he's still praying. Be not thou far from me, O Lord, my strength. Haste to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword. My darling from the power of the dog, save me from the lion's mouth. Will the cry of the forsaken Son of God be heard? Look at the second part of verse 21. There's a change right there. For thou hast heard me. Uh, Christ had the sense of not abandonment, but of God's overruling and his presence, at least at that point. If you look at the cries from the cross, they are laments, except toward the end. Uh, now, verses 21 through 26 describe Christ as victorious, uh, verse 22 talks about declaring God's name to his brethren in the midst of the congregation. Uh, most scholars say David is looking for the church here and speaking of what Christ did when he was resurrected and told the women at the tomb to go tell his brethren that he was alive. And here is something now Christ dealing with a group of people who are his own. I'm not going to deal with these verses, but uh, verses 27 through 31 talk about uh, a rule of Christ. Look at 27. All, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations will worship before thee. Now, whatever your view of prophecy, something like this happens at the end of the world. 
I like that he said, all the ends of the world shall remember. Was Christ remembering us when this was going on? And when they finally remember and realize it was his sin, they are by Rembrandt at the foot of the cross. <laughs> That's turning to the Lord. I'm looking forward to that time. And then the last verse in this says, They shall come and declare Christ's righteousness. People declared his forsakenness. They will declare his righteousness to a people that shall be born. Well, now that's definitely us. That he hath done this. In the Hebrew, it's one verb that he has finished. What was the last thing Christ said on the cross it is finished what was finished his suffering that's part the sacrifice the sacrifice for the sins of all of us when he died that's a fulfillment of John 17 4 when he said I've finished the work father you gave me to do even this morning we were talking about finishing some things I'm a great starter, and I have trouble finishing because I have interruptions. But isn't that a wonderful feeling to come to closure <laughs> with what you've got to do? It's a wonderful word. It's a word a servant would use, a slave would use when he was assigned a task by his master. He would do the task and come back and say, finished. It's a word that priests used. This surprised me examining an animal for sacrifice when he was sure it didn't have broken bones and sure it had no wounds or was not sick he would say finished this is acceptable it's the word rembrandt would have used one of his old paintings when he stepped back and said finished perfect it's the word a merchant would write on your sales slip when you were paying on it. Finished. Did you ever get that house note finished? That car payment finished? <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Paid in full. It is finished. That's how David ended the psalm and how Christ ended his sacrifice. This is a precious psalm. <laughs> 